So when it comes to SSH, uh, the thing is here, I'm, I'm pretty sure that ed everyone here in this room is using SSH, and I don't know even if you know how much you're using it, but probably some of you know. But what we will be talking about today is tunnels. And tunnels is an interesting thing. You will soon see why. Uh, the thing is that Git is based basically on SSH. Of course, you can use it with other protocols like HTTPS, but that really blows. It's not good. <laughs> so everyone is actually using it with, with uh, inside Git. So we are actually using it like tens of times a day at least, I guess, most of us. Uh, anyways, there are other things you can do with SSH. Uh, one of them being just accessing Linux servers, right? Um, but what I will talk to, uh, with you today about is uh, about tunnels. Because tunnels, uh, how many have heard about SSH tunnels? We should start with that. So we have a few, but we have lots of people that haven't heard about it. And my estimation is, I, of course, I'm just you know guessing based on what I've been doing. I see that less than 10% of developers actually know about tunnels or know how to use them. The thing is that this is really low-hanging fruit. This is, uh, this is something that you can learn. You can learn the basics easily in one evening, and in two evenings you will start to set up your own tunnels. And once you know this, this will be something that is always in the back of your mind, that like, you can fix stuff with this. So it's a very small investment, and it's a huge benefit, and that's what we are calling a low-hanging fruit, one, so one of those things that we can invest little and get much. So I will give you an example where I actually became a hero for one day in a, at a work, but this is just an example. Once you know tunnels, you will use it for all kinds of normal everyday stuff as well. Um, at one point I had uh, like a website that was based on a, on a gateway, uh, um, so a server, a work server that uh, was driving the application and I had a database. And at some point, I'm sitting in a car in Sweden. I'm from Sweden, so I was actually there visiting. And I was sitting in the passenger seat, and uh, it starts to beep on my phone. And it says that one of my websites that I'm responsible for is down. And when I start to connect my laptop to, through the uh, 4G and you know, see what's happening, what I see is actually that one host is not responding at all. It's like it was never there. And afterwards, I found out that something with the cooling system went wrong, so the server uh, turned, out, uh, turned off itself to you know, protect the hardware. But, uh, but the thing is that, that it just vanished, and what should I do, right? So as it happened, since I know uh, SSH tunnels, I was able to, I was sitting in a car in Sweden, I was routing with the help of SSH tunnels so that a laptop that was standing in my office at home that was just standing there, a Linux machine, I could, I could connect to that one <laughs> and then create those two tunnels and then quickly install from the nightly backup whatever was on that server uh, just running there. And of course, this is a temporary solution, but it solved the problem. And within less than one hour from the first you know, beep I got, I was up and running from missing a whole computer. Right? That's quite kind of cool. So this is the kind of stuff you can do once you know tunnels and you know that this is not impossible to route things however you like. I'm saying all of this, of course, to fire you up so you, uh, so you understand that this is a huge benefit and it's worth to invest a, an evening or two to learn this. <coughs> and as a stage tunnel, they are called tunnels, right? And they are tunneling actually TCP connections, which are the most common connections on the internet. Uh, they are called tunnels, so when you're Googling about information about tunnels, you have to use the word tunnel to get all the information about it. I will use another analogy, though, during this talk, which I will soon come to. <coughs> so tunnel is good, a good analogy from the perspective that it's encrypted. So one thing you can be sure of is that you don't have to worry about uh, doing a tunnel from one data center to another. As long as the tunnel is connected and it, it's powerful enough to transfer the data, no one else is looking at the data. So that's a very good part. Now we will talk about another analogy because this analogy is very, very important to start and thinking right about tunnels. Also, one thing that is, is a really, really, you know, such thing, it's very, very easy to think wrong when you, if you start to think about the SSH connection, the connection that the SSH is going on top and then trying to imagine the tunnel inside it, then you're, you will have a mental breakdown. So don't do that. The SSH 
is just in the base and just like Git, you don't think about that SSH is running. If you have a connection, then good. You just think about the tunnel on top of that, okay? And then you will <laughs> fare it good, basically. So tunnels have an entrance and an exit, and therefore we will be using another analogy in this talk. And the analogy is the socket. This is a wall socket. Um, and then we have the plug, right? And <laughs> TCP connections have a direction in one way, and there is uh, also another way where it doesn't. At the moment when you are doing the connection, then the TCP connection have a direction, kind of, because it always has to be a server somewhere that can answer when some client wants to connect. In that way, we have a direction. So for instance, if you have a website somewhere, there is kind of a socket here, and then when Chrome is here and you are typing google.com and pressing enter, then that plug is going away and connecting to that socket, right? It cannot be that Google is connecting the other way. In that way, I mean that there is a direction, and that direction is crucial for tunnels. So <coughs> direction example is uh, also when you are, for instance, working on your own computer and you have a node program and you have a database on the same computer, then you always also have a plug because in the program you're uh, writing something like mysql.connect, right? In the node program, it's never the database that is connected to you connecting to your program. It's always your program that it has to connect to the database. Of course, once you are connected, and in this way we don't have any direction anymore. Once the connection is established, then there is no connection anymore, uh, direction anymore, sorry. <laughs> then, then of course the node program is doing queries, the other one is responding, and then the data can flow as it wants in both directions. But in the connection, uh, moment, you have a direction. And that direction is crucial for tunnels to work. You have to know what end you are on, which is why we will talk about extension cords today to understand tunnels. Because extension cords have a kind of a socket, right? And then they have a power plug. So using this analogy, we will get the um, direction right on our tunnel, and we will understand how this works. So for instance, if you have this extension cord, which actually is the tunnel, it, the node program doesn't even have to know that it's not connected directly to the database because you have an extension cord. It's like if, uh, if you have a lawnmower, right? And it, it's connected with, with the power. The lawnmower doesn't care if you connected it directly to the wall or if you have a long extension cord. And in the same way, it's when you're using a tunnel. So these can be in completely different places in the world and they wouldn't know better. <laughs> so all clear so far? Yeah. So we have three types of SSH, uh, SSH tunnels. You don't have to, this will not be a test on these and I will go through those, but okay. So we have the L tunnel, the local connection. I will show you an example. I will show you an example of the remote connection and the uh, proxy connection when we're doing a SOX proxy. SOX proxy is a special case, but it's very, very cool to know about. The L connection is when, for instance, our colleague Erica is sitting at her laptop and she has a cool uh, graphical program to work with databases that can show some cool stuff. But actually, she wants to use that program together with a database that is on a web host somewhere else. So then she is using the L type connection, which is uh, when this program that is running on her machine connects to something that is a local socket, right? The, the this program doesn't know any better. <laughs> it connects to the local socket. But you have set up beforehand this extension cord or this tunnel that is actually going over and connecting to that database there. And bam, this program will be able to, without even knowing it, work locally with the data on that computer. The R-type connection, which I will also show you, is the other way around. So what you can have here is that Let's say that you have a website running on your computer. We will actually do it here. And you can actually be connecting. I will be hosting a web server for a brief moment here on this computer, right? And I'm now on, on uh, Bayer's network, as you know. So I'm behind lots of firewalls and stuff. There is no possibility in the, in, on the earth that I will be able to host something from Bayer's firewalls, right? But I am able to host a web server on my own domain through doing a remote connection where I'm doing this cord thing out to a web host that I had set up before this talk. 
and we will be connecting with the browser here, and we will see the page that is actually uh, served or hosted there. Uh, and the last thing is the SOX proxy. SOX proxy is like the poor man's VPN, you could say. If you have some web host available, what you can do is that you can set up a tunnel in a special way so that you can connect your browser to a so-called SOX proxy. And what will happen is that normally when you have Chrome installed on your computer, it would go directly to the internet, right? Directly on the local connection to the internet. But uh, if you are setting up the SOX proxy and we configure the browser correctly, then it will actually go through the tunnel and it will be this host that is actually going out of the internet, which is cool if this host is maybe in another country, then we can see how uh, some other website or our own website looks from the perspective of someone that is in another country without actually being there. I will show you that as well, if we have a time. Yeah, so actually we are at the live demo, so we will start with the first thing. And the first thing was, if I remember correctly, uh, we, we were talking about Erica, right? She was connecting her local program, her graphical clients for a database um, to a remote computer. So we can start with, we can start with, I have, I have uh, made two, two cloud hosts here. We have one cloud host that is, you see here in Frankfurt, uh, maybe I can do this a little bit bigger. This is my Frankfurt server that we will be using for the first two examples. But then when we are doing the SOX proxy thing, we will actually be going to the USA because we will see how a uh, page happens to look for an American. So that will be that use case, right? So this is a USA cloud server. So these are the two com computers we are using. Now let's do the e Erica demo. The Erica demo, let's see, can maybe I can. Show it somewhere on the, whoops, middle of the screen. In the Erica demo, this is the girl that has, is using the local program, but she's connecting to a database that is on a completely other computer. So the SSH and then this host, this is the same that we did when we were just connecting to the computer. So this, we don't have to worry about this, as I said before. What we're doing now is we are doing the, the local connection, and we are saying that the local port 13306 is going over to the other network, and on the other network, we are connecting to what is on localhost and 3306. So if you are using uh, Mari MariaDB or if you're using MySQL or something like that, you know that this is the default port. So actually, we are saying that on this port locally on my machine, I want to connect to whatever is on port, the normal MySQL port on the other machine. The reason I'm using another port here is actually because I have a MySQL here, so it will collide if I would fire up this tunnel, and my, my database is actually in the place of this connection. Anyways, we are connecting this, it's already connected, it's so easy once you know it. And uh, now we will, let's see here if I'm able to connect a graphical client. So we have the MariaDB client in this project that I have prepared in beforehand. We can just go and look at the uh, properties of this connection. And as you can see here, if you see something, you can see it maybe on those screens as well. But you see that we have this port 13306, as I said, locally. It's connecting to localhost. So from the pr perspective of the program, I'm actually working just on my local computer. It doesn't know any better. And then it's just a normal login. I'm connecting actually in this ID is actually already connected, but uh, I can double click on any, you know, uh, uh, table and it automatically loads it. I can, um, yeah, let's see some uh, bigger data set. I can look at the languages and you see that they are basically instantly here because Frankfurt is quite close, so it goes really fast. No problems there. And I can do a thing such as, let's see here, if I right click here and I do a diagram, so this is one of those things that is a little bit harder to do uh, in a text client. I can, for instance, show a diagram here of the database. And this is something that you might want to use a, a graphical client for to look at how is this database you know, wired and, and what is connected to what and such. So yeah, and this is remotely. You can basically do it even on the production database if you 
if you dare. <laughs> um, this was the L connection. Now we are doing the R connection. So I promised you that we would be able to host something from my computer here and out on the internet. And as it happens, I happen to be the very, very lucky owner of nodejswarsaw.com. So we will be using that domain. <laughs> and let's see here. So if we go out here, and now we will first look at that, at that command. This is the command that I will be using with an R, as you see here. So this is a remote port. So I'm actually something on the remote computer is connecting to something that is available on my computer this time, instead of the other way around that we had in the first thing, and that's the R. So I'm uh, making available on the other computer something on port 9000. And as soon as something on the other computer hits port 9000, it's actually connecting to my computer, local computer on port 8080. So I will be firing up a web server on 8080 on my computer, and then we have something on port 9000 on the other computer. And usually I would like to do it directly to port 80, you know, but the thing is when you, you know maybe about security in Linux, it's hard to open up ports below 1000 uh, easily if you're not like you have a special rights and stuff. So I didn't do that. I actually put in a normal engine X and just, I'm just on the other computer making 9000 going directly to 80 that way. So just, you know, I did a little cheat. Anyways, uh, let's fire this guy up. So now we have to fire up the web, web server locally as well. Uh, so we are going to do that. And let's see. I think we have it here. Web server temp. And here in web server temp, I just put one JSON file to be able for you to identify that we are looking at this directory. And now we have like this awesome node package that is called uh, HTTP server that you can install globally. And bam, we have a server running that is actually serving whatever is in the directory we are in, which is basically this JSON file, right? On 8080. So, uh, what we can do now to verify that everything is working, which I that am in confident in tunnels, am 100% sure that it's working. First, I'm looking locally, right? Locally on my computer. Uh, 8080, but that's not a big thing, right? This is automatic inside your computer. But now let's see a cool thing, right? As I said, I'm on Bayer's network. What am I hosting on the internet, right? When I go to Node.js Warsaw.com, and I'm hosting the same directory. It goes through this 9000, and it comes out the other way. And can I somehow prove to you that I'm not actually cheating here? Yes, I can, because I can take a picture file from a previous meetup, and I can just dump it here into this directory, and then I can go to nodejswars.com, and you can actually do that on your uh, telephones as well, and there is no problem with that. I'm pressing F5, and we have this image here, and yeah, it's served from my computer here. So it's, it's really, really useful. So it, it's almost like superpowers, right, for people that don't know how this is done, but once you know it, it's like super easy. And the last thing is the SOX proxy. Uh, so the SOX proxy is, it's a di diff completely different beast, by the way, than the, those uh, connections that we did, because now we are like routing things that we had on either, on one of the computers. Now we are actually using just one com computer as a new gateway for our internet connection. So let's see if I can maybe clear, do this, and show you just the command. Um, basically, the, the main part in this command is the D, which is the SOX proxy thing, and I'm starting locally on my computer on port 1337. I'm starting out this SOX proxy, uh, starting up this proxy, uh, starting up this uh, SOX proxy. And now we're going to the USA node that we are talking about, because connecting to Frankfurt is not that cool for a person in Poland, right? But if we connect to the USA, we, can act, we will actually be able to see the difference soon. I will, I'm just starting up this one right now, and then I will show you how you can in Firefox, I don't know other browsers that much because I'm just using Firefox, but anyways, if you write about profiles, this might be a command that you have not done before in, in Firefox, but anyways, 
normally when you do this on a norm normally installed Firefox, you only have two profiles because the first one is the normal profile and the second one is usually your um, private browsing profile. The third one is created by me and you see that I gave it a new name that is proxy profile. This is by the way a very cool way of being able to run in the same browser, start up different, different browsers that have different, completely different setups and they are treated so differently that they are very, uh, basically like completely different installations. I will fire up this um, browser here. So we are doing this and you can, you can see that this is this browser on those silly animations up there. This is my proxy profile. I spe especially give it another color to remember whatever pr uh, browser I am on because otherwise, you know, uh, you forget. And now we are going to start up also a private window. So here we have a browser where I'm basically here, but I'm using the normal connection from Bayer, right? When I'm doing the IP uh, in Bayer, uh, I'm in Warsaw. Oh, I'm in Warsaw, Poland. Strange, huh? But if I'm going to the browser with the silly animations, and I do an IP, it takes a little bit while longer because it goes to US and goes back again. But now we are in New Jersey, United States, you see? We are actually here in this browser, this, just this browser, we are here. I will show you also just briefly how to set up this in the browser because you saw that you use the minus D command to start the proxy on the SSH level. When it comes to the browser, if you just uh, search for proxy in, in the settings, you will see that you can come to, to something like this, probably regardless of which browser. I said manual proxy configuration. I said I have SOX host that is running, again, from the perspective of the browser. I'm just connecting to local host to the lead port, right? 1337. And also I added that uh, DNS, I'm also proxying uh, DNS over SOX so that it doesn't actually matter, but it's uh, when you're looking up host names, otherwise you're doing the lookup on the normal network. Uh, but of course, okay, one thing that also is very, very clear. Uh, I'm never condoning to do anything stupid on the internet and you will be really stupid if you think that this is kind of, you know, hiding you in some way because you have it, you are connected to the host that you're using in some way. So don't do something like that. This is very good though to try out different scenarios. For instance, being in the USA in different ways. And you can see, for instance, what how latency is. When it, if you are... If you connect to, to a server in New York, it's probably very similar to the experience that someone in, in South, South America has to your server because of the latency. In that way, you can just you know, try out how bad is my <laughs> site running in, on that latency. That's another thing. Uh, we will be doing one experiment more just to uh, see how we can use this. Oh, by the way, there are lots of like streaming services for news and such in the US that only work on US IPs they will start working when you're using this. And let's see if I go to this, this is the private window, and I go like to Google the first time because this is in, the, in a private window, then if we are in Poland, we always get this, right? And we are in Europe basically because we have the rights of a European when it comes to our data and such. Let's see what happens in, in USA if you are uh, American because they are bragging about all their rights and stuff, right? It takes some time, but yeah, you don't have any rights. We own you guys. <laughs> no, I'm just joking, but you understand what I mean. It's, you can see how a site is behaving completely based on, on wherever you are. Another thing that might be interesting is that uh, it's only the latency that's actually bad because the bandwidth is actually quite good. On those hosts, we, all, uh, always, we are almost always uh, able to push close to one gigabit. So even though the interactivity might be lacking, if you see something that is streaming a lot, like for instance, uh, Google Maps, then you will see that it's actually not that bad. It's actually quite fast because the bandwidth is fast. <laughs> that is no problem. It's just that the, the latency is uh, not good. So, yes. Okay, that was that for demos. And I hope that I inspired you so that you will I feel that it's worth to invest kind of a, uh, an evening in doing this.